Hi, uh, my name is uh, Marco Del Seta. I run the organization at Oracle that implements Oracle eBusiness Suite Configurator for our hardware products. Uh, the topic of today's session is uh, scaling for success with Oracle eBusiness Suite Configurator. Uh, we are really going to talk about uh, some of the challenges that Oracle has overcome in implementing eBusiness Suite Configurator, some of the lessons and best practices that we've learned um, through the years uh, as the application has grown within the company. Uh, Oracle has obviously been growing um, by purchasing a lot of hardware companies that has expanded the scope of products in the system. Uh, we have also grown in terms of capabilities that we offer. Uh, we have shown uh, and demoed mobile UI in a previous session. Uh, that's been a big uh, incremental project and one of our objectives is to grow the application implementation both in size and in capability while maintaining optimal performance as well as uh, not dramatically increases the resources needed to do that. Uh, we will talk today about how we do this and um, give some pointers and lessons uh, that we believe will be of use to Oracle eBusiness Suite Configurator customers. So, uh, let's uh, walk through the program agenda. Uh, we will touch on five topics. Uh, we will give a general overview of uh, how big is Oracle Configurator uh, at Oracle today. Uh, we will then talk about uh, model management at Oracle. Uh, model management is a relatively recent configurator capability that allows us to grow the number of products that configurator serves while um, basically keeping a uh, optimal performance in the system. We'll discuss a little bit how it works, how Oracle has implemented uh, this capability and what we do to monitor and keep it uh, as efficient as possible. Uh, we will then talk about data management at Oracle. Uh, we will cover some of the challenges that we have overcome with Configurator in managing our data growth, uh, the growth in size of our footprint. Uh, what kinds of things have we looked for to improve and um, keep the footprint small while increasing more and more what the tool does? Uh, we will then speak about the trade-offs between rules and configurator extensions. Um, Oracle implements a sophisticated version of configurator. It uses a lot of extensions. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about some of the trade-offs between rules and extensions in terms of gaining efficiency for uh, configurator deployment times, for how quickly we can make changes, uh, we will also cover a little bit some of the things we have done to our data in relation specifically to configurator extensions and walk through some examples that show how uh, proper management of data that extensions use can significantly affect how big the footprint is. Uh, finally, we will talk about test automation, uh, one of the critical aspects of um, uh, doing frequent releases for Configurator and keeping them at a very high level of quality is to uh, optimize your testing strategy. Oracle has developed a set of tools and capabilities around the test space that significantly help uh, in um, speeding up the testing and the coverage of the testing that we do. Uh, so we'll run through that a little bit and explain what we do and how it impacts both our timelines and our quality. So, let's begin with uh, a general overview of our implementation. Um, how big is Oracle Configurator at Oracle today? Uh, we have 153 models which we support in our production implementation. Uh, we do one release per month. Uh, we drive anything between 120 to 150 changes per month into each release, covering anything from new products to redesigns, major or minor, 
to very small tweaks and changes. Uh, last quarter, for example, saw five new products worked on uh, that Oracle released as new hardware products, and some products uh, having templates changes in any given release. Um, we run over 50,000 automated test cases per each release. Uh, this allows us to achieve near-perfect quality measured and less than five out-of-cycle fixes needed on average per release. Um, in terms of usage, uh, we are running at around 220,000 configurations. Uh, this was last quarter at an average of 3,500 per day. This was Q1, uh, the first quarter in Oracle's fiscal year, so it's a little maybe slower than usual. Uh, daily peaks can hit anything as high as six to 7,000, sometimes even a little higher. Um, finally, it's worth noting that well over 90% of the tasks uh, that are required per release are completed on time based on our schedules and our program milestones. So uh, let's talk about model management. Uh, model management at Oracle. Um, Oracle makes extensive use of this framework to optimize performance for the models we implement. And let me speak a little bit about what model management means. Uh, model management is the practice of taking configurator models and splitting them out amongst a number of JVM pools. Um, traditionally, uh, when one loaded models into Oracle Configurator, all the models would map to every pool. Um, so if you had 100 models, uh, every pool would load all 100 models. Um, now we have the ability to break those models out, let's say in groups of uh, 20, and load 20 models in five different pools, or load them in different numbers, if we prefer. This has the advantage of decreasing the overall load that each JVM has to deal with, uh, therefore um, optimizing performance uh, and certainly increasing performance in cases when overall loads on JVMs happen to be significantly high. Um, our models at Oracle are broken out among seven different JVM pools uh, now, one of the critical things that we do is we measure memory usage per JVM continuously. We track peaks. Uh, we also are very thorough about tracking memory savings in JVM pools. We'll see an example of that uh, later on. Um, another thing we do uh, that we correlate with that is we measure the number of configurations per every model constantly, and we then add them up on a per pool basis in specific windows of time. Uh, let's say we may look at how many configurations we did for each model um, in the peak two weeks of a given quarter. Uh, we do this constantly, reassess it, and trade it off with um, the measurements that we make of the peak usages on the JVMs from a memory standpoint. And then once or twice a quarter, depending on the quantity of product changes and the way that the business conditions shift, uh, we will rebalance the pools. Namely, we will look at which models were assigned to which pools and maybe change them around so that uh, going forward, um, Given that we know we have some new products coming in, some of the older products will be used less, uh, we can still support optimal performance. Uh, the general message is that uh, you cannot make model management a one-time exercise. Oracle uh, realized, as we were working with Oracle eBusiness Suite Configurator, that Sometimes products and models are used a lot, sometimes that usage decreases, and other products are used more. Uh, if you don't rebalance, uh, you can still create less than optimal conditions on your JVM pools. So we have put together essentially a number of tools uh, that lets us 
um, monitor all of this and make these decisions based on ideal data sets. Um, now, this approach does require more memory in our infrastructure, yet has really benefited us by significantly improving the performance of the tool. And we are really helping eliminate any potential JVM bottlenecks that may happen uh, at peak configuration times. Um, let us look at a diagram. Uh, for example, uh, this is a diagram that uh, outlines uh, our different pools. Um, the green bar shows uh, peak memory usage um, on uh, each of our JVM pools. Uh, the blue and uh, um, orange bars show um, more standard heap size, uh, heap usages and heap sizes for each of the pools. Um, so again, this is one of the diagrams that we uh, frequently generate and review in order to see uh, where we are with uh, overall system. Uh, you know, these peaks are within what you would expect to see. Um, the other bars give us a better idea of what the standard usage is on the system outside of peaks. And in no cases do we uh, end up significantly crossing uh, or shooting up high and creating problems, which is essentially what we are trying to achieve through model management. Okay. So much for model management. Uh, let's now talk about uh, data management at Oracle. Um, needless to say, a little is a good thing with data. You want as little of it as possible. Um, now, a little bit of an overview on uh, what our models look like. Uh, we primarily use BOM models along with some non-BOM features used to improve usability of certain option selections. So ultimately, our objective when we run our configurator is to make selections on the BOM model. Uh, we do add a fair amount of uh, information in the system to provide more of a guided selling framework to our frontline users that use the tool who don't necessarily find the BOM model structure ideal for what they are trying to do. Now, our hardware models have some options that are used globally across very many models, uh, populated from item types using non-BOM options. Um, some examples of these are uh, power code features. Obviously, we have a huge number of power codes, uh, as well as country selections. And country selections are an interesting case of a non-BOM feature that helps a user make a more informed and helpful selection through the configuration process. Uh, it may be a feature that is not listing any hardware, but simply a list of countries that, uh, when picked, will help filter out options that aren't relevant to the country you are going to ship your product to. Now, uh, when we populate option features with item types, we need to be very careful of the number of items and the number of properties used on the items. Um, using properties that are not needed for the model logic can significantly increase the memory footprint of the model um, of more than a factor of 10, in fact. So we measure the impact of property value data on model size, and we continuously run data cleanup projects to ensure that our model footprints do not grow too much. Now, let's look at some extreme cases. Um, one of our ZFS storage engineered systems models uh, went from 509 megs in size to 32 megs thanks to a project to clean up some option features and populators. Now, this is huge. Um, a 509 meg model can significantly impact the stability of your JVM. And uh, essentially, the options that we started looking at were bringing in a lot of property values with them that simply weren't needed for what we were trying to do in the ZFS storage engineered systems models. So, 
we went through, cleaned all of that out, and this is really our most extreme case uh, where we had a reduction that was 15-fold in terms of the footprint. Uh, we went from a model that was significantly challenged performance-wise to a model that uh, now runs flawlessly. Now, uh, the reality is when you have many models running on a JVM, uh, one can achieve significant across-the-board memory reductions, even if they're small per model, by regularly removing and cleaning up properties that are not being used on items that show up across the majority of models. Uh, the idea is that uh, small savings per model can also equal hundreds of megs when you have over 150 models that you're releasing into production. And we have had several examples where these cleanups have had noticeable impact overall, even if apparently not significant on a model by model basis. Okay, so, so much for data management. Um, now, rules versus configurator extensions. Uh, what are configurator extensions? Uh, configurator extensions are a framework for essentially adding small snippets of Java code to configurator through the standard rule development process. Namely, when you add an extension to configurator, you are not doing a customization of the configurator eBusiness suite framework. Uh, you're adding uh, the uh, Java class through a mechanism that is included within the framework of configurator developer. So the standard story is that with increasing complexity, one might go from standard logical uh, configurator rules to the configurator rules that are written in the simplified language known as CDL, configurator development language, all the way up to Java classes, if that's what is required, all working within the rules framework of configurator. So Oracle makes extensive use of CXs, both for usability purposes and for efficiency and development. Um, it allows us frequently to write once and reuse easily. Uh, this requires balancing a number of considerations to maintain speedy performance and timely deployments. Um, for example, we cache all the data which configurator extensions need for placement rules, running summaries, and pricing. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, our objective when we um, run extensions in Configurator, and we run extensions in Configurator at Oracle continuously through a session, is to not have to read from a database what uh, any attribute might be that the extension needs to do its work. We want that data to be in memory, so we cache it and that way our CXs, which used to run in batch, at the end of a configuration can now run all the time with no performance impact. Now, each model has its own set of data. You cannot use a singleton on a JVM if you leverage archiving, which we do to simplify how we release configurator extensions in our models. Uh, as a result of this, to optimize the performance for a model, we went through an evaluation exercise and decided that we should only load data that any given model uses. Uh, we would initially, for example, take the pricing data that all our models need and load it all with each and every model. Now, most models use only a very small subset of items that will need to be priced as you make selections in Configurator. Uh, we found that by slimming down the item, the item pricing that we load to only the items in that model, that significantly reduced the footprint of the model itself. And this applies to all the data. We started out doing it with pricing, but then we looked at all of our models that use uh, CXs which read their own data and scale down uh, for all the models to just the data that they need. 
Um, so this is certainly an example of how this can impact. Uh, this is a before and after diagram uh, on the set of data uh, for one of our models, JVM pools, after we did a uh, reassessment of our CX data to achieve model-specific caching. We basically halved the footprint, standard footprint at runtime on our JVMs by going through this exercise. So it's a huge reduction, 1.3 gigs less average load on our JVMs after we did this. Now, uh, another example of where configurator extensions can be traded off, and we're going to shift the conversation a little bit here. We have talked so far primarily of uh, sizes of models, footprints of models, and these impact performance primarily of your models. Uh, for us, scaling and being able to grow what we do is not just about maintaining performance, um, our success is also dependent on our ability to uh, make the changes we need to make quickly and to a high standard. Um, one example where making some trade-offs um, can significantly help that is uh, where we trade off rules versus configurator extensions. So we sometimes use configurator extensions to make our development process faster and more data-driven when it makes sense. Sometimes a simple configurator extension can do the job of a number of rules in a more condensed fashion. If the same rule set is required in many instances, even say many times in each model, running a configurator extension which reads simple attributes makes it a lot easier to write the rule and maintain it by then maintaining data. We don't have to rewrite that rule uh, every time a new instance is added, the extension runs and knows that the rule is needed for certain objects in the model, and provided that the right attributes are set up, um, that significantly speeds up the time for developing, say, an abstract rule capability in an implementation context. Now, uh, what is our paradigm extreme case for this example? Well, we had a situation where we were writing rules somewhere in the order of about 5,000 of them to handle a standard functional requirement. Uh, these rules were obviously spread throughout our 100 plus models, about 100 of our 150 models. Uh, so we were looking at at least 50 a model, sometimes many more. Um, these rules also changed all the time and we had to go in, open up the rules and play with them in order to essentially maintain them. Now, what we did is we replaced all of this with a simple configurator extension and a very straightforward, easy to understand set of data attributions that allows for total attribute driven maintenance. So now when we need to maintain uh, some of these uh, rules and change them, improve them, add them from new products, all we really have to do is change a small piece of data and everything flows through seamlessly. So a significant improvement in the time that it takes for us to uh, do uh, what is one of our most regular cases of maintenance in our models. Okay, um, final topic, uh, test automation, uh, doing more and doing it perfectly. Um, test automation is really the key in many ways to deploying 153 models once a month. This means deploying configurator on a regular date without schedule fails or postponements. Test automation has also allowed us to address any issue within 24 hours, even less when bureaucracy is removed. Now, the first ingredient of an effective test automation methodology is to have a framework for the simple and rapid design and maintenance of test cases. So, you know, we have a number of folks, uh, they're not primarily developers by training, who do the testing for our products. Um, we didn't want them to have to uh, do anything too complex 
in order to create and maintain test cases. Uh, so what we did is we've designed a very simple language, pseudocode if you like, for non-developers to put together configurator tests. Uh, without going too much into the capabilities of this, it basically allows us to train non-technical folks very quickly um, in a couple of, in a few weeks uh, to do all the maintenance and setup for the test cases that are needed for our products. And this obviously has significantly improved our ability to be effective at uh, uh, running test automation as a whole. Now, the second ingredient, of course, is an extremely fast execution framework. Now, a lot of testing that is automated these days is automated for web applications over user interfaces. Um, this essentially uh, causes a performance hit, I guess, to the tests that you run in the sense that doing any kind of activity through the standard web user interface will essentially be more or less the same speed that a very well-trained human being uh, would be able to achieve manually by going through, um, say, a standard test. So with Configurator, if a user takes, if a very good user, say, takes 10 minutes to go through a configuration uh, over the web interface, um, a web automation framework that runs through the UI is going to take about what, maybe six to eight minutes. Now that is slow. Um, that means in order to expand your test scope to the tens of thousands that are needed to ensure you have quality for your implementation, you're either going to need a lot of hardware or a lot of time. Neither of those were particularly appealing options to us. Um, essentially, what we did is we built a framework that bypasses the user interface for testing our web app, talks directly to the configurator engine, and by doing this, we've been able to achieve a situation where we can run some tests in a second or even less. Right? This means that we are able to run tens of thousands of tests overnight on our development instance. That's hugely improved our ability to basically uh, achieve levels of quality um, some years ago we couldn't even dream of. Um, combined with an effective way for managing test design, uh, we are able, in effect, to create a comprehensive coverage suite and run it uh, repeatedly without really impacting our schedules this is really key in achieving um, very fast turnover. Uh, our, we, we have great ability to accommodate very quick changes, easily less than a day. This is really uh, fundamental to that. Now, the third ingredient uh, that I want to mention uh, that really helps us um, achieve test automation efficiency is the speedy detection of test failures. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, if I run 10,000s of tests and I have a number of errors, I have bugs that I need to correct, um, being able to run that many tests is not going to be of much help if it takes a person a really long time to sift through the results and find out where the problem is. Now, our execution framework uh, is essentially set up to compare the expected outcomes with the configurator results report any mismatches, uh, highlight them, so our testers can immediately identify the issues. Um, in essence, their job is to design the tests. The tests will include what the expected outcomes should be, load them into the execution framework, uh, kick it off. You know, it will run very, very quickly. Uh, when they come back, they will see a report that tells them exactly where all the problems are. Uh, so again, critical to the efficiency of this whole thing, uh, they can immediately go in and find out what the problem is. 
the result, uh, we can run 60,000 tests and retest our whole deployment in two days. So we can essentially do a full regression of everything we do in two days, probably even a little bit less. Um, let me conclude uh, by taking you through a uh, quick uh, diagram. Uh, this diagram shows um, the frequency of tests executed over a standard um, Oracle configurator monthly release. Oracle releases its hardware products um, once a month, officially. Uh, so we align our schedules to the general availability dates. Um, peaks, as you can see, uh, can be as high as 25,000 in a single day. Each of those bars represent a day of uh, work day of activity during a month. Um, clearly, we don't ex execute the full 60,000 tests in two days typically because the work throughout the month varies around. Uh, in fact, we'll typically execute many more than uh, 60,000 tests, but our peaks can go as high as 25,000 in a day, and that is pretty much running our test system at full bore. So, in conclusion, um, just summing up, uh, we've talked about um, the size of Oracle's configurator implementation. Uh, we've talked about a number of capabilities we have put in place uh, in order to manage the growth of that implementation, uh, keep it fast, keep our releases frequent, keep them at a high quality. Um, we know that a lot of our customers uh, share the same needs that we do and hope that the presentation was of some help to them in uh, um, getting some ideas for how they can improve their own implementation. We talked at the beginning of the presentation about how uh, one of the significant ways in which we have expanded our capability recently, scaled up and scaled up successfully, is by introducing a mobile version of uh, Oracle Configurator that will be available for everyone to see and use. Um, so right now I would like to uh, share with you as an example a video that we have made that shows how both the current UI work and how the mobile UIs uh, are intended to work. Um, it will be captioned and essentially give you a feel for how the new UIs, the mobile-based UIs are pure mobile, how the co content and controls change, and uh, just generally give you a sense of what I was referring to at the beginning of the presentation.